Ever wondered why some programmers seem to navigate through complex projects like a hot knife through butter? Today, I'm unveiling the secret weapon behind such coding finesse, the solid principles with some practical examples. This isn't just your typical programming jargon, it's the blueprint for building software that stands the test of time. You may be thinking, why should I stick around? Well, because I'm not only going to decode what SOLID stands for, but I'll also show you how embracing these principles can elevate your coding game from just hitting the compile button to crafting masterpieces. So what is this magical acronym SOLID all about? Let's break it down for you. Starting with the S, it stands for Single Responsibility Principle. It's like saying, do one job and do it well. Imagine if your coffee maker suddenly started making toast. Sounds handy, maybe? But when it breaks, you'll have neither coffee nor toast. Not so handy anymore, right? As an example, let's consider a piece of software designed for managing a bookstore. The software has a class named Bookstore Manager, responsible for handling book inventories, processing sales, and also managing employee schedules. Now, imagine it's a busy Monday morning and a new shipment of books arrives. At the same time, several employees call in sick. The Bookstore Manager class is overwhelmed trying to update the inventory and adjust the schedule simultaneously. Because these tasks are so intertwined within a single class, a minor bug in updating the inventory could accidentally erase the entire employee schedule. Suddenly, you're not just dealing with an inventory issue, you've also got a staffing crisis. This is like your coffee maker that also tries to make toast. When one function fails, it jeopardizes the others, leading to a cascade of problems. By adhering to the SRP, we would have separate classes for managing inventory, processing sales, and handling employee schedules. This way, a bug in one area doesn't spell disaster for the others, ensuring that your bookstore or your breakfast runs smoothly. Next up, the O as it stands for Open and Closed Principle. This one is about being open for extension but closed for modification. Think of it as a Lego set. You can add to it endlessly with new pieces, but the base set remains unchanged. Your code should be just as versatile. As an example, consider an online music streaming service that allows users to filter songs by various criteria, such as genre, artist, or release year. Initially, the service has a song filter class with a method to filter songs by genre. As the service grows, there's a demand to filter songs by new criteria, such as mood or popularity. Following the open and closed principle, instead of modifying the song filter class each time a new filter criteria is needed, which risks introducing bugs into existing functionality, we create a more versatile solution. We define a generic interface or abstract class for a song, say I song filter, with a method filter. Then we implement separate classes for each filter criteria, such as genre filter, mood filter, popularity filter, etc. Each class implementing the iSong filter interface. This approach is like a Lego set. The original song filter class is the base set, which remains unchanged. Each new filter criteria is an additional Lego piece that can be added without altering the original set. This way, the music streaming service can easily expand its filtering capabilities by adding new classes for additional criteria, keeping the system flexible and robust without needing to modify existing code. Next, the L, which stands for Liskov Substitution Principle. This might sound fancy, but it's basically saying subtypes must be replaceable with their base types. Imagine if every time you asked for a pet for your birthday, you got a dinosaur. Exciting? Yes? Practical? Not so much. Your code should not surprise users with unexpected behavior. Consider a software application designed for a pet adoption agency, where a base class pet defines behavior such as eat, sleep, and play. There are various subclasses representing different types of pets, such as dog, cat, and bird, each implementing these behaviors in their own way. Now let's introduce a new subclass dinosaur as a pet. While a dinosaur is technically a pet, its implementation of the eat method might involve consuming vast amounts of food not typically stocked by a pet adoption agency or even a local zoo, and its play method could inadvertently cause chaos due to its size and strength. If the pet adoption software isn't prepared to handle these unique behaviors because it was designed with the assumption that all pets eat kibble, enjoy gentle play, and can be easily housed, it will run into problems. Adopters expecting a new furry friend could be shocked to find a T-Rex delivered to their doorstep. This highlights the Liskov substitution principle. The dinosaur subclass should not introduce such drastic changes that it can't seamlessly replace the more conventional pet-based class in the context of the adoption agency software. Every subclass added to the system should behave in a way that doesn't surprise or break the application, ensuring that when someone adopts a pet, they get an experience that's delightful, not destructive. Now onto the I. It stands for interface segregation principle. 
It tells us not to force classes to use interfaces they don't need. It's like signing up for a gym membership and being forced to take knitting classes. It's great if you're into that, but why not keep them separate? Let's consider a software system for a digital content platform, which includes features for users to manage their profiles, upload content, and interact with other users through messages and comments. Initially, the system uses a single, bulky interface called User Actions that includes methods for all these features. In this scenario, not every user needs access to every action. For example, content creators need the ability to upload and manage content, while average users may only want to browse content and interact with others. However, because all functionalities are bundled into the user actions interface, a regular user who only wants to change their profile picture or post a comment is also burdened with the complexity of contents which they never use. This situation is akin to signing up for a gym membership to get in shape, but being required to take knitting classes as part of the package. While knitting might be a delightful skill to have, it's unrelated to your fitness goals and adds unnecessary complexity to your gym experience. To adhere to the interface segregation principle, the digital content platform could refactor their system by breaking down the user actions interface into smaller, more specific interfaces, such as profile management, content management, and social interaction. This way, each class only needs to implement the interfaces relevant to its purpose. Content creators can implement content management and social interactions, while regular users might only use profile management and social interactions. This approach simplifies the system for users by ensuring they are only exposed to the functionalities they need, just like having a gym membership that lets you focus solely on fitness class without the unrelated burden of knitting lessons. Last but not least, the D, which stands for Dependency Inversion Principle. This principle advises us to depend on abstractions, not on concretions. It's like saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket, especially if that basket is made of glass. Code with flexibility in mind. As an example, imagine you're building a notification system for an application that alerts users about various events, such as new messages or system updates. Initially, the system is designed to send notifications via email. So you have a notification service class directly instantiated with an email sender class. Now, consider the email sender as a glass basket. It works well under certain conditions, but what happens if your users prefer to receive notifications via SMS or in-app notifications instead? Since your notification service is tightly coupled with the email sender, changing the notification method means redesigning the entire notification system. This is like having all your eggs in one fragile basket. If it breaks, you're in trouble. To apply the dependency inversion principle, DIP, you would design the notification service to depend on an abstract notification sender interface rather than the concrete email sender class. This interface could have various implementations like email sender, SMS sender, and in-app notification sender, allowing the notification system to send alerts through any channel without requiring major changes. Each sender type, email, SMS, in-app, is like a different basket, and the iNotification sender interface ensures you're not relying on just one. By depending on this abstraction, you're not just avoiding putting all your eggs in one basket, you're also ensuring that if one method of notification becomes obsolete, or if there's a new preferred method, your system can easily adapt by simply adding a new implementation of the iNotification Center. This design fosters flexibility and resilience in your application's architecture, allowing it to evolve with users' needs without significant overhauls. In our journey today, I've unraveled the mysteries of the solid principles, from ensuring each piece of your code has a single purpose, to designing with future growth in mind, substituting components smoothly, keeping interfaces lean, and relying on abstractions to keep your code flexible. These aren't just guidelines, they're the foundation for crafting resilient, adaptable, and clean code that stands the test of time. And just when you thought I was about to dive deeper, I've reached the end of this coding saga. Remember, great coders aren't born, they're made, one solid principle at a time. So do you think you are a solid coder? Share your victory or horror story in the comments.